And at the beginning, um, I want to mention that this is not really my work. This is uh, the work of us as a group. So I have a bunch of smart people in my team and they are all doing excellent work. And I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, so what I'm going to show today is a case study where we um, use the One API ecosystem to prepare Ginkgo, which is a sparsely algebra library for Intel GPUs. And the background, maybe I should also mention that. So we are a part of the US Exascale Computing Project. And like uh, jean laurent just mentioned, there is a plan to have an, um, an Intel GPU uh, for Exascale. And the plan is to have this GPU inside the Aurora supercomputer, which is supposed to be the first Exascale system inside the US. So there is a strong interest on in having uh, numerics ready and libraries ready for this um, Exascale supercomputer. And this is why we look into porting Ginkgo or having a backend of Ginkgo for, the one, uh, for Intel GPUs via the One API ecosystem. So I give you a brief introduction about what Ginkgo actually is. Um, so Ginkgo is a open source math library. So anyone can use it, um, contribute, uh, sell it, whatever. And um, even though the focus is on high performance sparse linear solvers, so think of um, iterative solvers, preconditioners and eigensolvers, um, the framework is very general such that it allows also to deploy other functionality if needed. It is um, part of the E4S and the XSDK ecosystem. So that is an ecosystem that bundles high performance libraries that are used by application scientists. And this bundle is by default installed on uh, US major computing facilities and increasingly also on European um, supercomputing facilities. And um, the design that we have, and here I refer to the right hand side, is that we have a backend model where we have a library core that um, composes all the algorithms, high level algorithms, and then we have backends for different hardware. So, um, excuse me, that was too quick. Um, so, we have a backend for OpenMP supporting hardware, a backend for uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, based on CUDA, a backend for AMD GPUs that is based on HIP, and a backend now also for, for Intel GPUs and other Intel FPGAs that are supporting DPC++. Additionally, we have like a reference backend and that is just sequential CPU kernels. And we use that for actually checking the correctness of all the kernels that we deploy for the, um, uh, the actual accelerators. So, if we um, think of the figure that we have seen yesterday a couple of times, and uh, I just uh, shamelessly copied that, um, where do we sit in this ecosystem? So we would see ourselves maybe as a middleware. So on top of the um, uh, One API uh, DPC++ language and also the libraries. However, for users it might be as we are a library providing uh, numerical linear algebra, we could also be seen inside this um, library section here. We are not specifically um, focusing only on, on um, Intel hardware, but we are uh, providing capabilities that are currently not inside the Intel libraries. And as far as I understand, will probably also not be there in the future. So for example, iterative solvers, credit of solvers, preconditioners, and so on, that will likely not make it into uh, the one MCAL -like library. Um, so the approach that we took for, for creating a DPC++ backend for Ginkgo is very much based on the um, DPC++ compatibility tool. And for those who haven't uh, attended yesterday's talk by Igor Robotchev, I think it is an excellent talk and I, I heavily recommend it. So it's uh, online in the slides, you can, you can see the slides. So I think um, that is a really good presentation of that tool and we made heavy use of that tool. However, um, as Igor already indicated yesterday, um, for complex code bases, it might not be a straightforward thing, but there might be some manual fixes necessary. And this was the case for us. And I list a couple of challenges here. And some of those are actually um, strongly related that we are the ones who actually want to get the, the last flop out of the hardware. So we really uh, have the goal of, of outperforming other libraries and providing 
the good or the, the best performance that we can possibly get. Um, we have a track history of achieving that goal on CUDA and, and uh, HIP uh, supported devices. And the goal is now also to, do, to get that for, for DPC++ supported devices. And um, for that, for example, we might like, have use of cooperative groups and, and atomics. And um, there are some flaws in the DPCT um, uh, compatibility tool, uh, like Igor mentioned, and we need some manual fixing. Um, another aspect is that DPCT plus, uh, DPCT generally um, uh, tries to convert all code that is inside a file. However, that is often not our attention. So we only want to, to um, convert certain segments. So we need some manual fixes there. Uh, we also need uh, handwritten adjustments of some parameters to get better performance. And um, a maybe larger aspect is that uh, if you want to convert a function, uh, DPCT uh, requires knowledge about all the dependencies. So you need to include like the headers for that. And um, with this, um, yeah, here I have a small example that I maybe skip in, in, the, in the aspect of time, but this is basically an example where uh, we have seen that DPCT fails to convert cooperative groups so cooperative groups are a, a functionality that allows to have very quick communication, very high performance communication within threads that are executed uh, in parallel. And we found a fix for that, or we implemented a fix for that. Um, and overall, we have a certain workflow that is again, very similar to uh, what Igor suggested yesterday. So we first separate the functions um, that we want to convert. And then we also employ some workarounds to avoid DPCT from converting code that we don't want to convert. Um, and then we actually run the DPCT script on these isolated kernels, however, including the header files, such that um, it is a, uh, possible that DPCT uh, converts the launch parameters. And then we have some additional fixes, like I mentioned then, and in the end, um, we can reintegrate uh, into the software stack. While this workaround proved to be very useful for us, um, there's one more thing that I want to mention explicitly, and that is um, that we would like to um, avoid a structure like this. So this is, um, was shown also yesterday by Igor, and that is showing basically um, a combination of host code and accelerator code inside a single function. And uh, in our model uh, that we have, where we have the algorithms specifically um, separate from the um, kernel backends, we, we cannot uh, move forward with this stru uh, code structure. And the second aspect, and um, this is actually uh, from the talk from uh, Steffen this morning, um, the, the CUDA calls and the SQL DPC++ calls to kernels are different. And um, while we are maintaining Ginkgo as a library that is uh, supporting several backends, and for uh, maintenance aspects, we would like to have a very similar design of the, uh, of the, of the kernels and how they are called. And for that reason, we actually introduced an additional layer, um, an additional layer that allows us to have a high uh, level of similarity in terms of how the kernels for the respective backends are called. Um, and also, and that we just have to be honest, um, the group composes of people that have experience, extended experience with CUDA and maybe HIP programming, not so much SICL. So if now um, we have that knowledge, we would like to still be able to, to uh, write kernels in a fashion that is similar to, to CUDA and HIP while acknowledging that at some point this may change and we go more in the sickle design of kernels. However, for now, that, um, that approach of having an additional layer that allows to call the kernels in a very similar fashion um, that proves to be very, very, very useful. And here I just show an example. So for example, for a CUDA kernel, you ship in the, the shared memory while for a DPC++ kernel, the, uh, the um, 
the shared memory has to be uh, submitted with the kernel invocation. So um, uh, in the CUDA kernel, it is allocated inside the kernel. So um, we have this additional layer such that in both cases, um, the memory is actually then um, created in what we call the, the mid layer. And um, for the kernel call, we don't have to worry about shared memory. So that is just an example. So using that workaround, um, we were able to, to actually create a DPC++ backend within probably two weeks. Um, two weeks of a person who has uh, really experience in writing, uh, writing code and writing um, uh, kernels for GPU architectures. Um, however, I think this is a, a very uh, strong uh, statement that uh, more or less two weeks were enough to get a um, mostly functional backend for, for Intel um, DPC++ supporting devices. Um, so in the end, uh, we needed to, to enhance the uh, DPC script with, a two, uh, with another, another script with about 200, 350 lines of code. And we are also happy to share that script, even though we think it is very much customized to our library. But uh, the workarounds that we, we use in this script might still be useful also for other libraries. Now, having a backend for uh, DPC++ is one aspect. Um, but as I, as I already mentioned previously, we you really aim at getting um, as much performance as possible. And therefore, uh, for several months now, um, we are optimizing our kernels to the uh, DPC++ ecosystem. We also have to be honest that we, from time to time, stumble across um, uh, functionality that is not yet implemented in one API. And um, we have also a very vivid exchange with Intel folks, and we are very thankful for that, um, where we can report our issues also, for example, with 1MKL. We can report our issues, they take a look, they provide us feedback and uh, then things are incrementally fixed. So I think this is also a very important aspect that Intel overall is very open to, to um, uh, reports and experiences. And um, if you have a big problem and you reach out to them, they usually get it fixed. So that is um, on that side. Um, so what we do might, we have we right might have now? A, yeah, sure. We might have a question, Unique, sure. you can ask. Uh, yeah, um, the the two weeks. Yeah. Um, is it meant as it, is it functional and equally performant as the original, or is it just functional? Um, functional, not equally performant. So um, there, I have to also say, um, equally performant is difficult to to judge because you're uh, we are running on in the dev cloud, which is totally different hardware. So um, you can at most say like um, equally performant with respect to the theoretical hardware performance. And there I also have to admit that the answer is no. So um, there is further um, tuning needed. But again, um, this is, uh, we are talking here about kernels that are, so on the CUDA or on TIP side, we are usually outperforming the vendor library. So we have a very high goal in terms of the performance that we want to achieve. And um, for DPC++, we are probably not yet there. And this is, uh, has also to do with, um, I mean, I think this is not a secret. It's a new hardware. Uh, we have to look into it. We have to understand how things work and so on. Yeah. Okay. It was just uh, for clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Further questions? Not, oh, I guess you. I'm just gonna continue. Um, so what we do we have right now and this is um, also in terms of uh, functionality that might be interesting for other, other applications. So we have ported most of the basic BLAST functionality. Respectively, we interface to the one API BLAST functionality. We have um, sparse matrix vector product kernels for CSR, COO, LPEX, SALP, hybrid. So this is different formats for handling sparse matrices. And um, while CSR is definitely the most used one, um, certain matrices have uh, characteristics that favor a different storage format. Um, for example, L is a format where you pad all um, rows to the same number of non-zero elements. And therefore it's very attractive for, 
for um, systems that have a balanced non-zero distribution. Um, here on the middle, you actually see a performance comparison against uh, the one MKL CSR SPMV routine. And here you see like we are actually outperforming the one MKL CSR um, routine on the generation nine um, GPU. Um, we have to be fair here. So we are of course proud of performing one MKL CSR. However, uh, one MKL CSR does not use um, device memory. So it, it is based on using the shared or the unified memory. Um, and uh, we, we imagine that if one MKL would use the device memory, they would probably also get higher performance. Um, with these results, we also approached the one MKL team, reported that, and um, we will see whether they will actually change their approach in the future. Um, we also have a set of iterative solvers here on the right hand side. You see the uh, performance for these iterative solvers on the generation nine GPU. And we have ICG stuff, CG, CGS, FCG, and GMRS. These are some of the Krylov solvers that are frequently used in, in, um, in applications, in particular, if you look into fluid flow simulations. Um, we have some ongoing um, efforts. Um, this is providing additional uh, sparse basic functionality like SPGEM and SPGEM, so that a sparse matrix times sparse matrix um, and uh, sparse matrix addition. Um, maybe this will also be included in the one API um, framework at some point. Um, we're happy if that happens. Um, we are also looking into multigrid methods and um, implementing for them for the DPC++ ecosystem and then advanced preconditioners like uh, ILU preconditioners and threshold ILU preconditioners. And these are this is functionality that um, we don't expect to be part of the one API ecosystem or uh, of the one MKL package. Um, Overall, probably one more thing I should mention. So um, the approach that we take is um, device only. So um, uh, once uh, we, ha we put the data on the GPU or, or on, the, on the accelerator and uh, we do everything on the accelerator. So the host is only used for, for launching the kernels, but we, we avoid um, any, any um, uh, accelerator host communication. Um, I actually have a small example of what we are already able to do um, on uh, the Intel GPUs. And you, uh, it's actually a short simulation of the heat equation. And um, I down here have the link so you can watch that video also afterwards or see what we do. And um, as Ginkgo is open source, you also find that, um, that example inside the Ginkgo um, repository on GitHub. And actually, I think I have the video here. Um, does it work? I guess that didn't work. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Um, so, and this is now the complete workflow. Um, and you have already seen that before, but it's, I guess, repetition is also useful if you're learning things. So we first log in into the dev cloud. Um, and then I guess uh, we go into the right, um, right folder. And um, then uh, I guess, let's see. Yeah, so now we are looking into that example. So we just increased the font size because uh, we thought maybe otherwise it's too small, but afterwards I think it's really large now. Um, so uh, this is the, the example where we have a um, heat equation solved using um, uh, Ginkgo as numerical backend and also running exclusively on the, on the Intel GPU. And I guess we start, yeah, so this is actually some, uh, some uh, simulation specific parameters. You can see that. Um, and then um, I guess uh, 
it's um, mostly set descriptive. So we use a CG solver. So uh, for solving the linearized systems and then uh, we compile that, I guess. No, uh, should now receive an error. Yes, um, so we, we, uh, this was compiled for the CUDA backend. So using the um, uh, CUDA executor, and obviously we don't have an NVIDIA GPU here. So we just changed that. It's one line of code that has to be changed to use the DPC++ um, executor. And then uh, we build it again. And then we can hopefully see that the build process is correct. So that is very convenient for application scientists that don't want to look deep into, into programming for a certain architecture. So um, this is for Ginkgo, you just have to in one place change the executor. And this is uh, related to the model that we use where we have um, the algorithms completely separate from the actual device backend. And then you only have to change the executor. So you have to say, for for which um, which uh, backend you want to compile the code, and then in this case we run now on the Intel GPU, and I guess Yeah, now the um, simulation has completed. Um, we have created um, an output uh, video that we now con con convert to a different format such that you can actually use a Jupyter Notebook to, to visualize that um, or to show that video actually um, inside. Uh, so this um, file is still like in the dev cloud, but using Jupyter Notebook, we can, um, actually play that video, which is also very nice. And uh, yeah, so this is now the video. Um, it's a heat equation simulation. Um, of course, we now chose like a certain, uh, certain input data, but this can of course be generalized to others. And the idea here is not that we want to show, yeah, you can use, um, or you can like, uh, excuse me, um, you can like run, uh, uh, you can run like a heat equation simulation, but the goal is really to show that um, uh, this framework allows to you to write code and run it um, using a tiny little change in the dev cloud. Um, so this is where we stand right now. We have a, a fully functional backend for the DPC++ um, hardware, and uh, we provide um, algorithms that are not included in the 1MKL ecosystem. And um, we are um, looking forward for further collaboration with Intel in particular because our experience with um, the porting effort of having the first uh, functional um, backend was very positive. And we want to actually name a couple of people here, uh, Alina, George, uh, Sujata, Klaus Dieter, uh, Edmund and Artie. And they were all very helpful. Whenever we had problems, uh, we could reach out to them. And I think this was also a very important factor um, that enabled us to, within a very short time, actually have a working backend. And with that, I think um, I'm done and I welcome any questions. <laughs>